Here with Darwin Smith, uh, former Meadowbrook High standout in the Morning Cup, uh, integral part of the 2007 Jamaica Pan Am Games football team that won silver, they lost to Ecuador in the final. Uh, Darwin, welcome back to Jamaica. Uh, you were you away in the US for some years. I uh, went to Bethel University. Then, uh, where after? All over. All over. <laughs> all over. All over. Uh, you're back here in Jamaica playing in a Red Stripe Premier League for Tivoli. Uh, a lot of people expected you to, to be in MLS by now or somewhere else. Uh, why the Red Stripe Premier League and why Tivoli? Well, there's no place like home, first and foremost. There's no place like home. And it's a joy to be back home. Um, with regards to the overseas exposure game, I've been there, I've done that. So it's just a matter of time. You just need the perfect fit. And I think that the, with my skill set and the aim in which Tivoli has portrayed to me, through the coach, I think that is the best bet. And that is the best place for me right now. All right, you were picked number three overall in the supplementary draft, MLS supplementary draft in 2011 by the New England Revolution. Correct. What happened there? Well, evidently I did the hard work, you know, and I just found out. Uh, what happened, however, was circumstances beyond my control with, in, as, with regards to a bureaucratic process. And you can't control it. Um, things don't work out for whatever reason, and then you just have to pick up yourself and you move on. So, with regards to that, we have no regrets. We're just keeping up the hard work, and, and thus far it has been paying off. Okay. Um, you joined the USL Pool Club and the Pittsburgh Riverhounds. River Hounds. Correct. Yeah, they, they, they picked up your rights after the New England situation. Tell us about the experience there. Well, well, a small correction. They didn't pick up my rights, however. Seattle has my rights. Seattle has my rights. Seattle no. Saunders. Right? Yeah, Saunders has my rights now. What happened with them is that I was loaned out to them because of the situation with New England and Seattle. So what happened in the interest of me playing and not just sitting around, I was loaned out to Pittsburgh to finish out the year. So that's what happened with regards to that. But it was a good experience. Um, a lot of the top prospects, the top players coming out of the college league that either weren't necessarily ready for the MLS or players that were recovering because it's a partnership with them and thing. And it was a good experience just to be there to be associated with some of the players that have been in the professional league, have played extensively overseas, and to be there with these same players that you're playing against now. So it has always been a professional atmosphere and always good. A lot of people would say, you know, the MLS is a much better league. Um, other leagues across the world are far better than the local Premier League. Um, so they will ask the question, what is Darwin doing here, such a high quality player? Well, first and foremost, I've, I've, I've heard the question a lot. I've heard the question a lot. Let, let me haste to say, I have no regrets coming from. None whatsoever. None. And the reason being, if you figure more than less things aren't working out to your best interest, you pick yourself up, you find your comfort zone, and then basically that's where you go back to the drawing board, and then you go again. And it's not necessarily things that weren't working out for me. I think that being home would have provided the best avenue right now for me to embark on better things that I have planned. And those are? And those are to be back overseas. Uh, we have a lot of things in the pipeline, but right now, until pen to paper, we can't do anything. So those are just things in the pipeline. For now, I'm playing for Tivoli Gardens. I'm a representative of that. So the aim moving forward is to be a part of the Caribbean Cup coming up and then just try to stay healthy. Because once I'm healthy, everything else will happen. All right, a couple years ago, while you were at Bethel University, Manchester City showed some kind of interest. How was that? Well, hard work. Um, they were very much impressed. I got invited to the game. Um, Scored against them as everyone know. That's a New York tournament, right? Huh? Yeah, uh, we played against them in Chinatown actually. Um, I got invited on the tour, the preseason tour that they had in China. Mm -hmm. Paperwork, I wasn't able to go. Um, I flew back to Europe and then when I came back, things didn't pan out accordingly. So until, again, until pen to paper, mm -hmm. everything can't fall through. Mm -hmm. So that is just a situation. So what was, it, what was the problem? Why is it, is, it, is it a matter of that your interest wasn't that high? Or because you were at university? What was timing. 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 Um, then I was 
at a stage in my academic career where ball just couldn't take precedence right then and then. I had a few months leave, so it made no sense for me to embark on that when they could have waited because it has happened before. If they want you before, if they want you as much, they're willing to wait on you. You know, because anything can happen. I'm a realist, anything can happen after that. You know, and there's one thing that no one can ever take from me, and that is my academic interest. That is my academic qualifications. And that has proven to bring me where I'm at right now, recreationally. So I have no regrets regard to that. Uh, yeah, your Tore, um, what were the other Man City players that were impressed by you at the tournament? All of them. All of them. Um, notably, Adi Bayer came to me after the game and he was saying to me, he started late because based on, they were impressed with the fact that I had no fear against playing against them, to just being me. And I think that the hard work that I've put in over the years and he's still doing, um, that is just what is paying dividends. Um, Notably, he said to me that to just keep working. It might not happen today, but it will happen. And assuredly, I believe in that. All right, you mentioned schoolwork taking precedence over football. Um, you have your masters. You decided a lot of footballers wouldn't have decided to, to, to even, go, even finish their college years, much less to do their masters right in the, the prime of their, their lives. Um, 25 now. Uh, you decided to, to do your masters instead of going pro. You said there's no regrets, but tell us exactly, extrapolate on the reasons for, 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 for doing, doing that, for choosing education over football at the time. Again, no regrets. First and foremost, no regrets. Um, then, and still no, the matter is this. With my, my academic endeavors has been the driving force for my football career. That's the first thing. For me, both of them have been working. They have been able to coexist with both and have performed credibly on both forefronts. So I didn't see a need to choose them. What happened, however, and what had happened is the fact that even though I finished school, I was still able to get drafted and I got drafted pretty high. We can attest to that. However, had I left, and I've seen multiple instances of this, that people have left, talented, talented players, we can, numerous, and they have been back here, they have nothing to fall back on. Not one of those persons. First and foremost, I think that I'm a very ambitious individual. And as a result of that, I know that I can't play forever. I know several million players, several hundred thousand players that have played for all their life. And right now, they have nothing. I made a pledge to myself that that will never be me, because I can't play forever. All right, tell us about Bethel. Tell us about the experience there. Um, as I said before, you have your masters, but on the field, they did exceptionally well to the point that you were inducted in the Hall of Fame yes. uh, last week. Yes, yes, yes. You scored 46 goals in 77 matches and along with 39 assists. Um, tell us about the experience being at Bethel. I mean, just to sum it up, it has been a euphoric experience. Um, unbeknownst to a lot of people, prior to my college career, I was normally in a leading, leading role, but not to the forefront that you still have to bring the team on both forefronts, both from an academic perspective and from a sporting perspective. So Bethel actually developed the leader in me to at a point where it seemed as if, okay, without me, I know that things might fall apart. And I have to give all the credit to my coach and my teammates to let me understand that, hey, they need me just as much as I need them. So I play an integral part in that. Um, from Bethel though, I have no regrets. Um, I'm grateful for that. Um, I was able to achieve a lot of milestones that I didn't know would have been afforded to me right now. The, the highest accolade that being of inducted into the Hall of Fame at 25. Um, President, when he spoke to me about the induction, he said to me, I'm 25. When he got inducted into his school, he was 50. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely a milestone. But for Bethel to, to put to bestow such an honor upon me it just shows how much hard work that I've put in, into it and things. So I give thanks for it. All right, I spoke to your coach a couple of years ago and he had very high praise. Um, what, what he said that, that stuck with me is that he said, your education actually made you or your, your, 
should I say, your insistence on, on your score made you actually a better player. Could you explain, explain that to us? Does education and, and, and sport go hand in hand on the field? Does, does an educated player perform better on the field? Well, if you're at, well, evidently you're asking me, so we don't touch that for them. We don't touch that for them. Um, personally, I think the better players tend to be the smartest players. And for the position that I've been put in to lead the team, to, to be that player, that go to player, you need vision, you need intellect, you need sociability, you need to be affable that people can come to you, you can be a good man manager, you can have time manage yourself manage those that are put in your care and to have such high praises for yourself and those that are around you that you're not going to lead them astray. Mm -hmm. So that takes a high level of intellect. So undoubtedly, you need to have some level of academia, not necessarily just on the books, but to be able to think, to do deductive reasoning and whenever needed, inductive reasoning. So I think, yes, you need that. You know, that's a major culture problem in Jamaica. A lot of our youngsters, they don't necessarily see where education can help them on the field. So, as, a, as, a, as an individual, uh, distinguished, I must, I must say now, you know, being inducted and, and stuff like that, what do you have to say with them, especially the ones from the inner city, knowing that you are actually from the inner city, um, coming from Cassava Peace, what do you have to say to those youngsters? Yeah, from the goal side. Yeah. Um, I think the stereotype behind inner city youth has been the fact that they don't believe, right? Um, you're, you're, you're painted with one broad brush that if you're from a certain community, there's nothing for you necessarily because your parents haven't been afforded certain luxury, quote unquote luxury, that, okay, I might be able to, to be a doctor, lawyer, teacher, Indian. And I think the biggest thing for me was that I believe. I believe and I believe that I will be an exception to the rule, an exception to the inner city youth that I'm going to be a robber, an exception to the rule that I'll come out to nothing. Mm -hmm. Right? So I made it my priority to work hard, to be patient, be resilient, and overcome all foreseeable and unforeseeable barriers that I may encounter to know that, okay, at the end of the day, I'm responsible for me, where I am, where I plan to go, despite whatever tumultuous things that I may go through. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the only thing that they need to do, just believe and work hard. And you have imparted that since you have been here, a couple of weeks you have been back in Jamaica, you have imparted that to them? Most definitely. Most what definitely. has been the response? Um, overwhelming. Overwhelming, ma'am, if I should say overwhelming so Overwhelming, positive? Positively overwhelming. Um, just the other day, um, I spoke to a very distinguished um, coach here before. Um, he's always had high praises for me. Um, Carlton, Spana Dennis, mm -hmm. um, you know, anybody who knows Spana will know that he speaks his mind. And even though he hadn't coached me before, he had always has high praises for me with the fact that you know, quote unquote, Rick, you have your head on for your body. Mm -hmm. And I hope that you, you will find the time to come and talk to some of my students or some of the players that I have in my care because quote unquote, they don't want to do nothing. And as you say, the idioms that we have and the cultural stereotypes is a degrading part of how our youths are brought up in this day and age, both from an academic forefront and from a educational program. What do you what do you think can be done? Because even to, to this day we still have players not being able to play in the schoolboy competitions because of educational reasons. Um, whether it's discipline, whether they don't have the grades, we even see it transferring over to, to track and field. What do you believe needs to be done tangibly to, to, to fix that problem? Um, I think that is the problem. It's not necessarily a tangible perspective because you can't use one brush and paint everything. There's no one fixed stuff. I think you need to handle each thing by a case-by-case -case basis. Right? Particularly for football. I know, I know the training that goes into football. Right? But what happened? The, the administration, the ISA, has this thing that, okay, you have to have a certain level, a grade point average, to play. Mm -hmm. But what these players need to understand is that being average doesn't make you exceptional. And that is it. Everybody just wants to be average. You have just to, to get the passes. Just to, just get, to, just to get the passes. Yeah. So what happens is that things won't go your way every time. We all know that. Walt Disney failed 40 times. He went bankrupt about 25 times. 
before he was able to be the successor that he is right now. Nelson Mandela was in prison for almost 30 years. This man is now renowned as one of the greatest presidents of all time. So everybody goes through two multiple times. So it's how you overcome those. And from a tangible perspective, I think the coaches have a lot to do with it. In that coaches tend to just want to build on their repertoire, not necessarily remain, reminding, reminding themselves of the fact that we're talking about student athletes. Student athletes. Not athletes, student athletes. No, they just want to coach so it's, and not it's just groom. about coaching. It's about we winning now. Okay, what happens after? What happens if this youngster might be a talented one, but is not necessarily at the level to make it to a professional contract? So you're saying more coaches should teach as well as coach? What they need to do is that they need to be, they need to grow a holistic individual. The perfect citizen, the perfect student, the perfect young man a perfect role model by being a role model a lot of people will believe that that's unfair for a coach a coach is being paid some of them are even underpaid to coach so why is it on the coach necessarily to do you know societal fixing to provide societal remedies true fair 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 what i'll say is one of the biggest things that tend to be irrevocable is the fact that coaches don't like to take accountability for their actions, right? With the exception of parents and teachers, athletes spend most of their time with their coaches, right? The culture that you'll develop, your tendencies that you will develop will be as a result of those you spend most of your time around. So of course, you are blessed with the task of grooming these young men to make sure that they're molded properly for society that they can stand on their own two feet despite whatever they may face. Mm -hmm. As a player, may Waga rest in peace, David on. Mm -hmm. We affectionately call him Waga, as everyone might have known. Mm -hmm. There's one thing we had for years we had the top team in the country. We never lost anything. From under 12, we won it twice. Every one of those leagues we won twice. That's medieval, right? Medieval at Medieval. Mm -hmm. We won everything twice, coming right up. But at the same time, Offhand, I can tell you that we have five successors right now. Mm -hmm. We have five of those players. Kim Ardeli, one of them, right? Kim Ardeli, one of them. Robert mm -hmm. Palmer. Mm -hmm. Ramon Palmer from Calabar as well. Mm -hmm. Right? We have Andre Reid. We have several players. Mm -hmm. So it's not that it can't be done. It is things that has been done. It's just about you being a coach, not necessarily just wanting to win. How about if you, if this player that you're coaching five years ago, and he becomes a success, successor in life, he will always remember what you are taught him, you know. Mm -hmm. And there's one thing that I'll never depart from, what David on taught me. Life is tough. Mm -hmm. But it's how you take up yourself after those hardships that will make you a successful person. Mm -hmm. But a cultural negativity is the fact that we associate success with finance. Mm -hmm. And back to the question that you were saying about coaches not necessarily being paid enough or being underpaid, is the fact that because they gear their success to the financial incentive, they tend to negate from understanding that, okay, this is a young man, they're most volatile right now. So whatever they hear, okay, I score one goal, a big ball, I don't have to train anymore. Mm -hmm. Discipline is what we need in society. Mm -hmm. We need thinkers. But in the ball game, most times, because the coach knows that, okay, just kick the ball along, we win. But we can win a different way. There's no one way to do this. Mm -hmm. So if we should decide that, okay, let me groom a holistic individual that can play and think for themselves without me lamenting on them, okay, do this, do this, do this, when I say to do it, mm -hmm. and think, they won't take away the creative genes that they have. So with creativity and youthful exuberance, which a lot of our players have now, if it's not stifled, tomorrow will be a better day. All right, so, so compare the coaches locally. I know there must be a, a, a major disparity compared to the ones they had at Bethel and well it would be unfair to compare them against pro coaches but compare the, the youth coaches in Jamaica compared to, 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 to Bethel what you experience at Bethel it would be unfair to do an assessment like that mm -hmm. what I will say though and use one brush right across the back in any to have any success in anything in life is about being organized and I think that is one of the biggest problems that we as players as coaches as, as administrators have mm -hmm. not being organized 
and being organized consistently. Mm -hmm. All right, the Panam, Panam Games. Uh, I'm sure you know that's etched in your mind forever. Um, however, not a lot of players. You had a, it was it was one of the best Jamaican teams ever assembled, whether it's youth or senior. Um, a, a, a ton of quality players were on that team. However, not a lot of them have gone on to the senior ranks. Kemar Daly, um, your former teammate, your current teammate as a matter of fact, former at Medhaven, current at Tivoli, uh, and close friend, he got somewhat of a run at the senior team. Um, Eric Vernon, you played, you played right back at the time, right? Yeah, right left back. Yeah. He, a lot of people are asking about him right now. One of, one of the most talented players Jamaica has ever seen, youth players. He's nowhere to be found. He, I think he played in the DCL Cup one year. And, and of course you, yeah, you haven't, have you ever even been called to the, to the, to, to the, to the national level beyond the junior, junior level? We have been invited. We have been invited. Yeah, we have been invited. When was that? Uh, when Bora was here. That's Bora. Molitinovic. Yeah. Uh -huh. That was, but that was from 2007, right? No, 2008, 2008. 2009. And then we got invitation. We got two invitations after that. We got two invitations after that, but that was within school exam period. So that yeah, no, no. And you haven't gotten any calls since. We haven't been in contact since. You believe something is wrong with that? Well, from my part, not necessarily. But what I know is that it motivates me to want to work even harder. So from from their perspective I can't speak on behalf of them. But do you believe that he should have been called? I've, I've been doing the work. Mm -hmm. So it would have been nice to be rewarded. Okay, all right. So what do you have to say about because I think it's undeniable that Jamaica has a cultural problem as it relates to youth players. We tend to believe that Probably at this age, 25 now, you stand a better chance of getting called to the senior team than you were back then in the Panam time or, or at Bethel. We, we tend to believe that players have to be 22, 23 before they reach to a level where it is acceptable to call them to the senior team. What, what, what do you say about that? Well, I can't speak on behalf of the Federation. You know? mm -hmm. They don't pay me for that. But what I will speak of is the fact that you're right. You're right. Um, after the players reach a certain age, they tend to tell them that they're too old. Coming right out of school, they told us that we were too young, right then and there. Um, it's somewhat limiting, restrictive to say the least, but what we need to understand is that nothing happens before time. Time is the master. And for me personally, I don't worry about things that I can't control. I worry about my controllables and the only thing that I can really and truly control is the fact that I'm going to work hard. I'm going to make a relentless approach to work hard. But I will say this though, it's not a matter of what didn't happen. I know for a fact that soon and very soon that I will be in the setup, most definitely. So they might not necessarily want to conform or whatever the word that you may say and say, okay, the people are calling for this particular player and everything, right? But once you do the work, which I am willing to do and will continue to do the work to be a part of the national setup, but it's just a matter of time. I'm but in no rush. A lot of people would say at 25, you're old. No. You're old for, <laughs> for the, foot, the, 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 the sport of football. Um, a lot of other sports, you know, it's, football is a young man's game now, as you know. Um, Fabregas started at 15 in the national senior team. Fabregas is somewhere around 24 or the same age as you. A lot of people are shocked to know that he's that age because they have become so accustomed to hearing the, the, name. the name Fabregas for so long. Do you believe that um, if you were called back then, you understand it would have been better for you right now as it relates to your development and you know garnering a, a professional contract? What I do believe is that had we have the infrastructure that a lot of countries had at the time, things would have been different. Not just for me, but a lot of players that we have. Well, all the players that we have. We're way behind. We're light years behind. We don't have a football academy, as yet. That's the first thing. We don't have a footballing academy. Um, 
on my most recent trip, um, we're practicing. We're practicing with the academy team as well, just to stay in shape. And the level that these youngsters are playing at is unprecedented. We have players at 28, 29, 30, can't control the ball like these players. So it's not a matter of technically, technical abilities. Or it's not because of they don't want to do it, but things weren't afforded to them to be able to do that. There wasn't an avenue. But for me, at 25, I'm not old. Not at all. I um, spoke to your coach a couple of years ago, and he was bemused, <laughs> almost angry, that um, he didn't receive any kind of notification from the JFF of any invite for you. Um, he was shocked that, you know, a player of the quality of a Darwin Smith wasn't even invited to any kind of squad. Jamaican squad, you know? Well, well he has been, he is, mm -hmm. he is. To this day? To this day, mm -hmm. granted the current state of, well, what happened recently at the unfortunate dismissal of the national team to the next World Cup because mm -hmm. he was planning on buying his ticket to come and see me play mm -hmm. in the World Cup. Um, but we can't cry over spilt me. But what I do know is the fact that the Lord worked in mysterious ways. And if, if everyone remembers correctly, Yaya Toure, when he went to Arsenal at 24, they told Arsenal Wenger said he was the one of the worst players he has ever seen. Now fast forward three years later, at 28, 29, this man is one of the highest paid players in the world. Easily considered one of the better midfielders. So I'm not the least worried about my age. Because the fact that once you have determination, you're willing to put in the work, which I know that I'm always doing, things will happen. And it will happen. It is going to happen. Soon and very soon. All right. Tell us about Tivoli you now. How has it been so far? You know, what are the objectives for you while you're here? Um, well, first and foremost, Tivoli, it was basically a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. um, the, the fans are unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. Um, the coaching staff spoke to the coach and he, he had expressed his desire for me to play, to be a part of the team, not necessarily because of what he had seen and everything, but everybody knows that Tivoli crowd is a hard crowd to please. Mm -hmm. and for, as in most Jamaican crowd? As in most Jamaican crowd, but at Tivoli Gardens, and I quote him by saying, Bridget, this crowd here, we never see the ball for one player so yet. So he had been hearing about me for, for some two seasons now, because normally when I'm here, we normally go there and work out. But, that is either here nor there. I'm there now. Mm -hmm. Definitely the objective, the objective is to win this league. Starting with the Flow Cup next week against Waterhouse and then ultimately to win this league. They're in the semi-finals, right? Yes. No, mm -hmm. we're in the finals. We're in the finals, right? Yes. Um, by that, everybody has that aspiration. I know it won't be easy. I know it won't be easy. But those are the only two things that I haven't won locally. Mm -hmm. the only two cup. And I know that it won't come easy as earlier said, but I'm confident in the team that the coaching staff and the administration has assembled and I'm confident in my ability to add to that core of players mm -hmm. for us to achieve the ultimate objective. A lot of people were surprised that he didn't choose a Portmore or a Harborview. Um, and a lot of people are saying, boy, it's because Dada is here. Kemar Daly, did he have any influence with, with, with you choosing Tivoli? All right. I'm still getting knocks for that. I'm still getting knocks for that, saying I should have gone somewhere else based on my skill set. But at the end of the day, it's my decision. And with regards to Kemar, yeah, he, he's like a brother to me. You know, but he had, he had no say in my decision, as no one has always had. Mm -hmm. Any decision I make, it's for the benefit, benefit of myself. It's what I want to do now to get to where I need to be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I think that upon speaking with Siaga and upon speaking with the coach, that was the best thing. David Wagahunt, you mentioned it earlier in the interview. Um, unfortunately, he passed away. Jamaica lost a, a brilliant football mind. Um, you were one of his, his, his disciples. Uh, you have done very well for yourself. Um, explain to Jamaica how big of a loss David Wagahunt is for football. I mean, first and foremost, you know, may soul rest in peace. Mm -hmm. um, not only was he a brilliant football mind, but his 
overall approach to people. He was an affable human being, considerate. And I know it's easy to, to, to find all the wonderful adjectives to describe him, mm -hmm. but I'll just summarize it and just say that this man was bent on developing holistic individuals, well-rounded individuals. And to, to, to speak from a Shakespearean perspective, the, 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 the Renaissance man, to create the Renaissance man from inner city youths, from uptown youths, from irrespective of wherever walks of life you are. He was bent on teaching you life lessons through one tool, football, mm -hmm. a common goal that everybody loved. Mm -hmm. And we lost, we lost a magician. It, to, to say the least, because not only was he analytical, not only was he creative, but he was also insightful. Mm -hmm. a, a very good man manager, a very good time manager, and, and most of all, a very good encourager, a very good motivator. And f for me, by all accounts, and with the help of the Lord, I'm here right now. And, he, and it was projected that I wouldn't have been here right now based on where I was from. And mm -hmm. is there any truth to that? Somewhat. Football saved me, and he has played an integral part in that. So, I owe, I owe all the success that have been bestowed upon me thus far to him, to, for the belief that he had in me, and the blessing that the Lord has bestowed upon me. Mm -hmm. So, with regards to Jamaican football and world football on a whole, because I know that he had lofty ambitions, so I'm pretty sure that he would have been on the world stage by now. Granted, things went accordingly. And he was always. Um internationally minded, had a lot of perspective. He did. He, um, did. He, 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 he always tried to use international influence on his players to, to get them to do better. Which is right, and that is the only way. That he, was, he was always, as I said, insightful. He was, for, he was forward thinking. When, when we won the Super League, granted people might say the Super League is no league or whatever, but if you guys remember good, it took Boy Stone <laughs> some almost 15 years to get back to the Premier League. And they've always been one of the better teams, one of the biggest crowds. So it's not easy. It might seem easy, but it's not easy to get back there. We want it with schoolboys. So he was light years ahead of it. People are adapting that culture now. Things that they're seeing over on the television now. Because, mm -hmm. as you said earlier, Fabregas, the Garrett Bale, the Luis Suarez, those names have been household names now for quite some years. So we mm -hmm. think that they're old. Mm -hmm. Gerard was at 17. Michael Owen was at 16 as well. Mm -hmm. So what happened was that he decided to invest in youths mm -hmm. because if you can mold youths from an early age and get them where they're maturing and keep them together, they will do unthinkable things. And that is basically what we did. Mm -hmm. And that is where Jamaican football is lacking. And you, and you believe that if the program had a, a, a coach such as a Wagga Hunt, you'll be, do, be doing better overall at the junior level and at the senior level? Believe that? Well, Some people have said that. Well. Well, from, well, that is politics, and, and I can't spell politics from I was in school. <laughs> but what I do know is that there's one David Hunt. There can only be one David Hunt. Mm -hmm. However, if we had people, administrations, with the, with the character traits mm -hmm. and, and, and the thoughtfulness and insight to embark certain things that he had believed in, maybe we would have a different situation now. Mm -hmm. That is all I can say without a shadow of a doubt. But if it would have gone accordingly, had he been there, maybe, maybe not. But the perspective in which he had embarked is the one that everyone is trying to employ now. Mm -hmm. So we are four, five, six years behind. Mm -hmm. And that is the thing, we're lacking behind every, the rest of the world, which is why we're suffering now. The youngsters are suffering, which alludes back to the point that I'm saying. The fact that we are so much behind is even more integral that academia is at its highest precedence for these youngsters because if not we're not going to be able to make it all right thank you very much Dawin, no and problem. all the best no problem